At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. So let me uh, start off by saying I'm an astrophysicist, and I get to study the universe. Um, in particular, my specialty is weather on other planets. And my friends and I built a very special machine called an infrared superheterodyne spectrometer. And we built that at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And we take this machine uh, into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, up on top of a dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. Uh, it's about 14,000 feet, so it's almost three miles into the sky. And there's a marker on the top of the summit put there by the US Geological Survey that says this is the highest point on Earth in the Pacific. And there's a photograph, I don't have it with me, but there's a photograph a friend of mine took of me standing on the US Geological Survey marker, and it's a picture of Jeff on top of the world. And we hook this machine up to one of the most powerful telescopes on the planet, and we point the telescope to a planet maybe 100 million miles away. And with this machine, we're able to measure gentle breezes of two miles an hour everywhere on that world so we can measure the global winds of another world. And we've done that on Mars, on Venus, on uh, the largest moon of Saturn called Titan, which has an atmosphere thicker than Earth's. And so we're kind of interplanetary weather guys. And there's a whole story I could tell about why we do that. Why would you want to study weather on other planets? But the reason I'm really telling this story is to provide you a sense of what it feels like on top of the world doing astrophysics. Um, first of all, when the puffy white cumulus clouds roll in, they roll in a mile below your feet. So you feel like you're on a rock floating in the middle of the sky. This is the NASA Infrared Telescope facility, and these clouds are a mile below us. Anybody want to go? And when the sun sets at 14,000 feet, it's a sunset that's far more spectacular than anything you would see on the surface of the Earth. And when the sun does set, 10,000 stars fill the sky. And our city of stars, which is known as the Milky Way galaxy, is a bright double band of white that just arches from horizon to horizon. And I don't know if you know what 10,000 stars looks like, but it's far more visible stars than you would see from any dark site here on the surface of the Earth. And I don't care how many years of education you have under your belt, you're looking out into this vista we call the universe, and you're absolutely overwhelmed. Um, a teacher many years ago asked me, could you come up with a word in the English language that tries to express what it feels like looking out into the universe on a starry night from the summit of Mauna Kea? The only word that I've ever come up with is you're looking at majesty. It's majesty. And What's also really, I think, important about this story is a recognition that you're not looking at the universe from the outside. You are part of it, and it is part of you. You are integrally connected to it. You looking out on the universe is the universe contemplating itself. You looking out into the universe is the universe contemplating itself. And when you shift your gaze down to the horizon, you see that the, the, the little hills called cinder cones are populated with some of the most powerful telescopes on planet Earth looking heavenward. And you get this overwhelming sense that you're part of a human legacy of explorers. For 10,000 generations, we have been asking questions. We have been looking for answers. And every time a generation grew frail, it reached down to the children and said, I have taken these dreams the quest for answers as far as I can, it's now your, your turn to take us where we've never been before. And be content in knowing that all of the knowledge that was passed to me by prior generations, I give to you freely. And all of the knowledge I've acquired in my generation, I give to you. Now it's your turn to take us where we've never been. And every generation added to that book of knowledge until now in the 21st century, standing on the shoulders of all of those past generations, you see these powerful telescopes peering out to the edge of the observable universe and peeling back a veil on nature and seeing things that no human being has ever seen before. You have this overwhelming sense that you are part 
of a legacy of explorers. And there's, a, there's another level to this emotion too, a very personal one, and I remember I was, I was filling the detector on my laser system with liquid nitrogen and making sure that the high voltage across the laser tube was just right. And I remember saying, and my friend Fred is operating this massive telescope using what looks to be a Game Boy joystick. And on the monitor is this big image of Venus in a crosshair showing where we were measuring winds. And I remember saying to myself, man, this is like so cool. You started out in Little Red Train Nursery School. And now you're on the frontiers of human exploration doing things no human being has ever done before. And every time you take a step to a new frontier that is personal for you, you take the entire human race with you, and you start in Little Red Train Nursery School. And I think the, the important point in that story is the power of one is incredible. The power that lives in you to go to places nobody's ever gone before is amazing. And that's something that we have to teach all of our children. So I've just described three levels of emotion that I feel passionately um, this sense of belonging to something that I've described as majesty, this sense of human exploration as a lineage of, of, of explorers over past generations, and a sense that one individual can add to human understanding. And what I've just described, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, is science. It's science. It's wondrously emotional. It starts with the gift of a question. And what you do on a daily basis when you ask things like, I wonder what's under that rock, is exactly what scientists and engineers do and get paid to do it. And when scientists and engineers get their check in the mail, they say, I even get paid to do this stuff. And scientists and engineers look like you and me. Look, I don't wear a pocket protector. And so I think one thing that's really, really important that we as educators need to do and we as parents need to do is provide an authentic view of researchers and research to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers to take us where we've never been before. And that's why you guys are all here. That's, why this, that's what this, this, this festival is all about. So I think what I'd like to do is give you a sense of what we, as a species of explorers, have revealed about our place in a greater space through this, this, this remarkable quest to explore. And so let me ask a question here. What is the solar system? Just call it out. Uh, oh, very good. A collection of planets orbiting around a star. And our solar system, the star is called the sun. So the sun is a star like the stars in the sky? Why does it look so big and bright? Okay, it's not just close, it's really, 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 really close. And the sun has planets orbiting around it, and one of them is Earth. How many planets are there? I feel bad for Pluto, but unfortunately, Pluto is no longer a planet. And, and let me say that there are other things in the solar system. What orbits the planets? Moons, and what do we call those rocks mostly between Mars and Jupiter? Asteroids, and what do we call those big dirty snowballs or maybe more, more uh, snow than dirt, so they're snowy dirt balls about the size of Washington, D.C.? They're called comets. And beyond Neptune are the trans-Neptunian objects, more than a thousand of them that we know that are icy worlds like Pluto. Pluto happens to be just right now the second largest. Eris, or UB313 as it used to be called, was found to be bigger than Pluto, and that started the big debate as to whether or not Pluto was a real planet. But all of those things are held to the sun by gravity, and who's the mom? And who are the kids? Okay, so the solar system is the family of the sun. Okay, so now the next part of the story, I think, is to say that I was leading a team uh, about a, a little over a decade ago to permanently install a scale model of the solar system on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., between the Capitol Building and the Washington Monument. We had to go through the same approval process as the World War II Memorial, and it's been out there since 2001. It's called Voyage, and the scale model solar system is one ten billionth actual size. And I happen to bring the engineering sun that we, the first sun that we built, it's right over here, 
And it's got lots of different textures on it because we wanted to see how we wanted to represent the surface of the dynamic sun, a big ball of hot gas. Um, and this is at one ten billionth actual size. So the real sun is 10 billion times larger than that. Okay? So now let's kind of set this up. And I'm using the power of models to provide you a journey. So let's say this is the continent. Imagine the continental United States in front of me. Everybody point to California. Everybody point to Washington, D.C. Okay, good. So now I need a volunteer from the audience. Volunteer, come on down. What's your name? Alex, Alex come on down. My, I'm Jeff. Okay, come on over here. You're going to hold the sun. And here we are in Washington, D.C. So remember the continental United States. It's very hot. Be very, very careful. And if, as I walk westward, I get to the first planet, Mercury, Venus. And now I'm at about, okay, let's see if we can do this. I'm at about Earth right here. Actually, I'm a little bit closer, but I've got to stay away from that speaker. We're about 50 feet from the model sun. Okay, that's where I would be, a little closer. The Earth, the home of the human race, is smaller than the head of a pin. A million Earths can fit inside the sun. A million. The entire orbit of the moon, the only place people have been thus far, fits comfortably in the palm of a child's hand. Does anybody know the distance between the Earth and the sun? Call it out. 93 million miles. Everybody knows that number apparently. And you know, if you're in a, in a if you're in a science class and the teacher says the sun is 93 million miles away, and then the test comes and Sarah or Johnny uh, remember that it's 93 million miles, and they put it down on the test and they get an A, and no learning has taken place. None, because if if we are simply providing raw facts and information that have no connection to reality, that is not education. It is not education. Unless you say, are able to say, wow, and have an emotional reaction to information, no learning is really taking place. And so I can make you feel 93 million miles. A commercial jet, if you want to get you know, on Baltimore, Washington International Airport and go someplace, a commercial jet, typical speed is 600 miles an hour. That's 10 times faster than the speed limit on a highway. An Indy 500 race car is like, what, three, a little over three times faster than the speed limit. A jet is 10 times faster than the speed limit. Is a jet fast? If I could travel from the Earth to the sun at the speed of a commercial jet, it would take me 17 years to get there. Who's 10 years old? Who's 10 years old and wants to do a math problem? No, you've got to keep your hands up. OK, 10 years old, you want to do a math problem? How old will you be by the time you get back? 10 years now, 17 years to get there. Very good. Most people say 27, but they forget that it'll take 17 years to get back. You would be 44 years old. Would you be an old person? He said yes. <laughs> Is the sun far? Oh, didn't you learn anything? The sun looks so big and bright because it's really, 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 really close. If I keep walking, I'll get to Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and, 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 and Neptune, and I'm now at the dwarf planet Pluto, and your name was? Alex. I'm at the dwarf planet Pluto down near the Smithsonian Castle building, about half a mile from the model sun, and I'm waving at Alex, and Alex is waving back at me, and I just see Alex waving a half a mile away, and I'm looking from Pluto to Alex, and I realize the human race is on a tiny little speck very close to Alex. And I look down at Pluto, and I look at, at this tiny little world, much smaller than the Earth, and I say, how do those humans even know this exists? How do we even know this exists? And on this scale, if the grapefruit-sized sun is over there with Alex in Washington, D.C., the nearest star is a cherry called Proxima Centauri in Golden Gate Park, California. You got that? Now, you said that the sun was a star like the stars in the sky, so you're all stars. First of all, is it, is it possible that you all have solar systems? Yes, in fact, based on the current data, we think that the vast majority of stars form with solar systems. And you're all stars. You're like an assemblage, a, 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 an assemblage of stars. What do we call it when stars get together like this? A galaxy. And the galaxy that our sun is in is called the Milky Way. 
And Proxima Centauri and the Sun are two stars of the Milky Way galaxy. When you look up at the night sky, are all the stars that you see with the unaided eye Milky Way stars? Yes, they are. And do you think there may be a bunch that you can't see because they're kind of dim? Yes, there are. And there are enough stars in the Milky Way galaxy to give 50 to every one of you and have enough left over to give 50 to everybody that lives in Washington, D.C., the great state of Virginia, and the great state of Maryland. In fact, I have enough stars in the Milky Way galaxy to give 50 to every American. In fact, there are just enough stars in the Milky Way galaxy to give 50 to every human being on planet Earth. And we've only talked about two separated by a grapefruit in Washington and a, a little cherry in California. Are you getting this? And so let me say, the rest of this story, we've only handed out one galaxy in the insignificant portion of the universe that we are allowed to see, which is known as the observable universe, we think that there are enough galaxies to give 50 galaxies to every human being on planet Earth. And that, my friends, is majesty. And what's remarkable about that, if you feel small, is beauty has nothing to do with size. Because on this tiny little speck called Earth, there is a civilization of humans that have been asking questions for time immemorial. And today, standing on the shoulders of those generations, we have the ability to reveal that majesty. And it all came from something the size of this, the universe contemplating itself. Your address, you live in a town somewhere in the United States on the continent called North America, uh, in, 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 uh, on a planet called Earth, in a planetary system known as the solar system bound to a small star called the Sun, in the local solar group of stars in the Orion Spur of the Milky Way galaxy, in the local group of about 50 galaxies next to the Virgo cluster of about 10,000 galaxies, and the local group and the Virgo cluster are all part of the Virgo supercluster of 100,000 galaxies, and that is one supercluster of a million superclusters in the observable universe, and that's your address. And I think it is high time that every human being on this planet learn their true address because the human race needs a big dose of humility. So it, is that kind of cool? Okay, that's my playground. That's why I get emotional. That's science. And you're the next generation. So I'm gonna show you a few pictures. This is the Earth from space, and you can see one star is, is big and bright. That's the sun. It's only big and bright because it's so close to us. This is the sun up close, and you can see a little, those sunspots. That spot in the upper right corner is about the size of Earth. A million Earths can fit inside the sun. By the way, does anybody recognize this group of stars over here? Orion, and what's the star in the, in the upper left? Betelgeuse. A million Earths can fit inside the sun. 800 million suns can fit in the star Betelgeuse, and Betelgeuse is not the largest star. If you put Betelgeuse where the sun is now, it would swallow the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. Does anybody know who that is? Now, how do you know that's not Neil Armstrong? Who was the first to land on the surface of, who, who, to walk on the surface of the moon? Neil Armstrong. Well, who's taking that photograph? That is... Buzz Aldrin, and uh, let me just end with one, one story very fast. When uh, a few years back, uh, Gina Ross, uh, who was the principal of Buzz Aldrin Elementary School in Reston, Virginia, asked me if I could come down and talk to the teachers at the start of the academic year, the school year, before the kids arrived. So, you know, the teachers get there like a week earlier. And she said, Jeff, can you really get my teachers really excited about science and education and learning and do it across disciplines? I said, sure, Gina, that's fine. So I went to Buzz Aldrin Elementary School, and I was telling the teachers about how I was 11 years old when I knew when I, what I wanted to be when I grew up because I watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the surface of the moon on television. And I went out at 9 o'clock Eastern time in Uniondale, Long Island, and I looked at the moon so far away, and I realized there were three people up there, and I knew I wanted to be a space explorer. 
And so I'm telling this story to the teachers at Buzz Aldrin Elementary School, and this photograph is on, on, the, on, the, on the screen, and Buzz Aldrin walks in. Buzz Aldrin walked in. Oh, I was, I was terrified. I was telling them about my hero, and my hero walked in, and so I kind of com tried to compose myself. And he looks at this picture, and he says, oh, yeah, that's me and Neil coming back to Mike. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, a family photo. The most historic photo imaginable, the Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin returning from the surface of the moon and taking a picture by Mike Collins through the command module. This is a picture of the entire human race and what we're capable of accomplishing. And he walks in, oh, that's me and Neil coming back to Mike. And afterwards, he, wait, he was talking to the teachers while I was cleaning up, and he made a beeline to me, and he gave me one of those double-handed handshakes like you, know, like you know somebody, right? And he said, Jeff, he called me Jeff. And, and he said, Jeff, where did that come from? And I just looked at him and square in the eye. I didn't think. I remember that moment so clearly. I just looked at him, I swallowed hard, and I said, it came from you. Thank <laughs> you.